But good morning once again. We're glad you're here this morning and that you had a chance to, to celebrate Easter last week. And now, here's the thing. The week after Easter, a lot of times the attendance and stuff goes down. And we just need a little bit of a reminder of something. He's still risen even though it's not Easter Sunday. Okay? And one of the other things that we need to remember is that we were created for community. And I was talking with somebody last week. And they were talking about how they felt like they needed to, they just felt like the, the place they were in, they needed to pull away. Just so you know, if we ever feel like that, that's usually when you need to actually engage more with the people in your church community and not pull away from them. Because it's usually then that Satan wants us to get isolated and something other. But if we're in the church community, like God has given us, he has a chance to encourage us, to challenge us in different ways, all right? Well, let's go ahead and let's start this morning by starting with a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and start singing the first song. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you this morning. We thank you that we can celebrate once again that you have risen. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you love us, that your grace is abundant. Lord, thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for the fact that we have life in him. Lord, as we sing today, Lord, we use the music to prepare our hearts and our minds. Uh, for the word that's going to be preached later when Jeff comes up and shares what God's put in his heart for this week. But we just pray that as we worship now, Lord, we let the worries and the cares of whatever's happening right now just kind of fade away. And then we can focus our hearts on you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together the song, The Lion and the Lamb. <laughs>
saying? We doubled the amount of people that were here. So good morning once again. If this is your first time, welcome. We're so glad you're here with us this Sunday morning. If you've been here before, thanks for coming back. We're glad that you're plugged in here. Um, this, we've been studying the book of John. We kind of jumped forward last weekend because of Easter Sunday, but we're going to be going back to John chapter 13 today. So I'm going to ask Isabella to come and uh, do the reading this morning. John chapter 13, verse 1 to 17. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he built poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only, need, need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set to you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you, Isabella. I know I've shared a few things from Exodus the last few weeks. We've been going through it with the, the young people, but I'm, I'm going through it in my personal study. And I know sometimes I hear people describe God as... This, this being who basically set things in motion and kind of is far away and doesn't really care what goes on. But as you read Exodus, you see it's the exact opposite. Because you hear the people of Israel crying out to him and he says that he responds, he, say, he tells Moses, I have heard their cries, I have heard their calls. And then in Exodus 4.31, when he has sent Moses to them, it says, and they believed and when they heard the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Basically, what I want to share is this. I don't know what everybody's going through. I know I've got stuff I'm going through. I know different people have got different things. But the one thing that we can be assured of all throughout Scripture is that God is with us. He says he'll never leave us or forsake us. And if you're in a relationship with him, then you know that you walk with the Holy Spirit. If you're not in a relationship with him, understand that there maybe you have questions, and we'd love to have a chance to talk to you about those things. But understand this. God is not just this being that's afar off. He's a personal God who cares exactly what we're going through and the things that happened to us. And his son knows exactly what we went through because he came and lived a life just like we did. He understands rejection, he understands pain, all those different things. And because of that, we can actually say how great is our God. So let's go ahead and stand and sing that together. Mm -hmm. i uh -huh. 
Preaches the word that you just put on your side. In Jesus' name. Well, it's really heartening to be able to come and stand here and see not a load of empty chairs. I can see some empty chairs, but it's great to see your lovely faces filling them, the other chairs. Uh, and it's great that you're here with us this morning. Yeah, um, Got it the right way around. Do you like getting ready to travel? Do you like going on holiday? It can be chaotic, can't, can't it? But it can also be great fun. Saying goodbye, though, isn't always quite as easy, is it? Especially when you're not being seeing someone for quite a while. In our look through John, we're travelling back in time from last weekend. Brian's reminded us of that. Last weekend, we focused on Jesus' death and resurrection. Today, we're focusing on the part just before Jesus was arrested. 
So here are my headings to get us going this morning. Three things to notice from the reading that we had in John 13. His hour had come, his love was complete, and yet there was hatred confirmed. On several occasions, as we've been reading through John's Gospel, we've noticed the phrase, his hour had not yet come. Now John tells us his hour had come. What hour? What hour is he talking about? The hour that was planned from before the beginning of time. The hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus knew he was about to die. Then he would rise from the grave and he'd return to his Father in heaven. The Bible clearly tells us that Jesus came to rescue us from our sin. Now you may be thinking, oh come on Jeff, look, sin, that's not part of my life. I'm a good guy, I do nice things, I help people, I'm very kind. I'm... But we know if we're really honest with ourselves that things aren't quite right, are they? We all experience the brokenness of, of our own lives. You know, when we don't even come up to our own expectations, when we think, if only I'd not done that, if only I'd not said that, or if I'd done that differently. We know a brokenness in our own lives. And that's the brokenness that has its root in sin. And it's caused by us putting ourselves in God's place. Basically, sin comes from our self-centeredness, our refusal to accept God's direction in our lives. And Jesus came to rescue us from the effects of sin in our lives and in the wider world. And most importantly, to restore our broken relationship with God. So the hour had now arrived when Jesus would pay the penalty charge notice for us, for our sin, with his blood. Dying would release us from the penalty and the power of sin and its consequence, death. The hour, as Ryan reminded us last Friday, which had been planned way back in eternity, was now in time, the actual hour for which Jesus had come. So his hour had come. Next we notice his love was complete. Jesus had lived and worked among men and women, demonstrating God's love for them. In spite of his great compassion, most people rejected him. He came to his own, we read right at the beginning of John's Gospel. He came to his own, but they didn't receive him. Yet Jesus tirelessly conveyed his grace and his truth. Some people had believed and accepted him. These were the ones whom he loved completely, to whom he gave the right to become children of God. In spite of their sin, in spite of their brokenness, their doubts and their fears, they had believed in Jesus. And so they were welcomed into God's family. And praise God, that's what it's like today. Jesus welcomes into his family those who believe in Jesus and come to God through him. If you've come to God through Jesus, Jesus' love for you is complete. It's forever. It's unshakable. In spite of our sin, in spite of our brokenness, in spite of our doubts, in spite of our fears, if we've come to God through Jesus, he loves us to the very end. So, his hour had come, his love was complete, but hatred was confirmed. In stark contrast to the love that Jesus showed, Judas had plotted with the Jewish leaders to betray him. The devil had put it into his heart. Judas wasn't forced to betray Jesus. Judas had allowed that seed, this wicked thought, to germinate in his heart and mind. And here's something we can learn from Judas. 
We may naively think we're okay. We're safe. We're strong. The devil can't deceive us. Oh no, we know what scam artists are. We can avoid Satan. But Peter writes later in the New Testament, your great enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If you haven't yet trusted Jesus, the devil wants to keep you from believing in him. If you have trusted Jesus, he wants to deceive you, to wreck your life and the lives of others you know. He wants to dishonour God. So it's, we're on a lose-lose situation, aren't we? If we haven't yet trusted Jesus, the devil wants to keep us from believing in Jesus. If we have trusted in Jesus, the devil wants to trip us up. <coughs> Judas had no shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the evil one. He had no breastplate of righteousness with which he could be protected. Satan had thrown these evil thoughts into Judas's heart and mind. And tragically, he'd been enticed. He'd let the seed grow. He'd thought about it. Oh yes, maybe, what if? Ah, you. Sadly, he'd committed himself to betray the one who had shown him such love. So, <clears throat> That's the, that's the setting of the scene. Sometimes we stand in the airport saying our goodbyes, don't we? But it's tough sometimes too, isn't it? Jesus was about to leave his disciples. He must have been torn apart by what was ahead of him. Not just the suffering and the death, that was terrible. But he knew after his resurrection, he'd be returning to his Father in heaven. He knew what this would mean for his disciples. He was no doubt very troubled as he anticipated being separated from those he'd spent the last three years with. What could he say? What could he do? It was, after all, his farewell meal. I wonder what you and I would have said or done. Who's the best then? What do you reckon I think it's me? Oh, no, 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 no. No, you can't do this and you can't do that. And oh, no, no, it's not you. I think I'm the best. Can you imagine? That was the conversation around this meal table. And the disciples were trying to work out who was the top dog, who was the best one of them. And it wasn't the first time they'd had this conversation either. It's amazing to think, isn't it? Given the remarkable things they'd heard and seen, uh, that they were concerned which of them would be the most important. Which of them would sit at Jesus' right hand when they'd be in heaven? So preoccupied with themselves, the disciples hadn't even noticed that something was missing. But Jesus had. He clocked what was missing, and without a word, he got up, he took off his robe, he put a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin. I'm pretty sure that there was absolute silence in that room as the disciples looked on. But Jesus gives a practical demonstration now of his role as the Son of God. He got up from his place in perfection with his authority in heaven. He'd taken off his glory. He'd become a human being. And he was about to die for the sins of his people. Here in the upper room, while the disciples were arguing as to who was going to be the most important, Jesus took on the role of a servant. He chose to do something so demeaning that no Jewish slave would be asked to do. What humility. What submission. Was Peter the first? Lord, 
You, you, yeah, my feet. Blah, 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 yeah, blah. Jesus says to him, you don't understand. But one day you will, Peter. Peter, just watch, observe. Don't question, learn. Oh, no, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. No, 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 no. I'll wash them myself, Lord, but not you. How often can our lack of knowledge, our pride, our self-sufficiency get in the way of what God wants to do in our lives? As with Peter, surely there are times when we need to stop to watch, to observe, to be patient, put pride to one side and to receive. When we read God's word, when we listen to ministry, how ready are we to listen to what he wants to teach us? You won't belong, Peter, unless I wash you. Oh, oh, oh they wash me totally, Lord, my head, my hands, my feet. If you bathe, Jesus says, only foot washing is necessary. Trusting in Jesus is like having the bath. If we've asked for forgiveness for sin, he's pardoned us. Paul writes to the Corinthians, we've been cleansed, made holy, made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. However, in the comings and goings of daily life, feet become dirty. Well, maybe we protect ours, but in the Middle East, feet do become dirty. Imagine the disciples' feet, well, maybe you'd rather not. Dust, dirt, dung, they needed to be washed. Uh, and we too need to come to Jesus regularly and frequently to ask for that cleansing foot wash. We read in 1 John, if we claim to have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Yeah, the dirt that clings will be hard to remove if it's left. The stones that damage could lead to infection. And that's spiritually true. We need to be washed and refreshed and renewed. That will make us feel better, make our feet smell better too. And we'll have a lighter step for the glory of God. So, the scene, the hour which had been planned back in eternity had now come. Jesus' love, eternally driven, was now complete. Hatred, that evil, separ eternal separation, was now confirmed. Submission. The Lord of glory took on the most menial servant's role to demonstrate humility in serving others and the need for forgiveness for daily sin. So where does that lead to? Jesus took up his robe and sat down again. A hint before Jesus returned to heaven of him being raised in glory and sitting down at the Father's side. You understand what I was doing, Jesus asked. Can you imagine the stunned silence? It wasn't a trick question to embarrass. Jesus doesn't do embarrassment. He loves us and he wants our best, not our humiliation. The disciples knew that they were being challenged to think beyond their previous discussion. They knew he wanted them to properly understand the depth of his love for them and how this was linked to foot washing. So what was in his heart? What did this foot washing mean? You call me Lord, teacher. Right, I am your Lord and teacher. And I've washed your feet. You wash each other's feet. Don't just do what I say. Don't simply spend time discussing it. Get on and do it. What? Literally? Did Jesus want his followers to go around foot washing? Did he want them to turn his action into a religious ceremony? I think it's much more likely that he wanted his followers to show 
they served one another. Serving one another through everyday practical actions. Why? Why would he want this? What does he say? You will be blessed by God. You'll be made really happy. Yes, but more. He wanted them to experience something deeply satisfying. He longed for them to be filled in their inner being. Why? Because then they'd be celebrating how wonderful Jesus is. They'd be delighting in God and demonstrating he, what he's like to everyone around. So what might this strategy look like today? Firstly, we wouldn't be proud. We wouldn't spend time trying to prove ourselves better than other people. Secondly, we'd serve one another in the ordinary things of life. We'd be motivated by love, love of the highest order, love like Jesus' complete love for us and his Father. And we'd look out for each other and do whatever is necessary for our brothers and sisters. So how might this look personally? Some practical support for others. Maybe a friendly word. Offering up a seat here. Possibly sharing a meal. Perhaps some child minding. A car pickup. Taking someone to an appointment. Helping someone with their shopping. A bit of decorating. Fixing a tap if you've got those skills. Oh, what about as a church? Perhaps we could be involved in welcoming other people, helping with a setup or helping with a clearing away afterwards. We'd be praying for the ministry of the church, the outreach, what happens weekdays in our growth groups that we'd understand God's word better and that we'd be able to live it out in our lives day by day. And we'd be praying for Sundays as people join us and share in our times together. That God would be glorified here. Each of us could encourage others in open prayer when we have the opportunity, in conversations, or in keeping in touch with someone who we haven't seen for a bit. Maybe we'd be offering to help with the kids' ministry or being involved, doing something, however small or menial. And I don't think it's forcing the drift of the passage to consider the spiritual dimension to this as well as the practical one. The foot washing was symbolic of washing daily sins. Now, we're not Jesus, we can't forgive sins, but we can support each other to keep on the right track. We can pray for each other. We can encourage one another. And by doing this, we'll be helping to remove aspects of sin. We wouldn't be judging one another, but we'd be building each other up. And we need to be ready to have our feet washed too. Not to be too proud. Oh, no, 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 you're not touching my feet. I don't like my feet being touched, thank you. We wouldn't be too proud, preventing other people serving us. We need to be open to the care that others might bring to us. As we serve one another, we'll be blessed and we'll delight more in our Father in heaven. And we'll bring glory to, as others see Christ in us. By serving one another, we'll be following the pattern of Jesus, who loved completely, perfectly, to the end. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Serve one another humbly in love. May God give us the grace to do that. Let's go ahead and stand and sing the song that Jeff has chosen for today, The Servant King. Oh uh -huh.
see. Just a few notices as we finish up. Normally on a week, uh, we would have on Wednesday night growth groups, which is where we get in and study God's word together. Usually we have one at two o'clock in the afternoon, one at eight o'clock in person, and then one on Zoom. This week we're still off for Easter break. That way you know the next week we'll be starting up again. And it's where we get to sit there and try to sharpen and, and grow with each other. That's why we call them growth groups. Um, and we have the in-person and the Zoom options available so if anybody wants to join. If you want to know what's going on in church, uh, be updated throughout the week. We do have a church WhatsApp group that you can be a part of. If you want to do that, come talk to Jeff or myself or Austin, and we can get you on that. Uh, sometimes people put songs that have been encouraging or verses that have been encouraging. They'll share prayer requests. But that's also how we get the Zoom link out each week. Um, the next thing is the church weekend away. Uh, we need everybody who has already signed up to make their payment by the end of the month. Uh, if you haven't signed up yet and you want to go, there are still spaces. And I know Charlotte sent out um, if you wanted to go like up on Saturday one day, the day rates and stuff like that. But at the end of the month, we need to have the payments in. Um, Tony Merritt, who was part of Abbeywood Community Church when it started, uh, is now back in the U.S. He is going to be coming over and going to be our speaker. Um, going to be meeting up with him this week on Zoom, trying to prepare for the church weekend away. Uh, so he's excited to be able to see everybody and, and meet new people, and we're excited to have him come back and be a part of that. Um, also, this Friday, the 12th, at 8 p.m., uh, we'll have the evening prayer meeting at Paul and Peggy's house. Not Peggy. Rebecca. Rebecca. I don't know why I said Peggy. Rebecca. Yeah. Paul and Rebecca's house, 8 p.m., and then on Saturday morning, uh, the 13th at 9.30 a.m., we will have our next men's study. Uh, even if you've missed one, please go ahead and, and feel free to come in and jump in and be a part of that. Uh, we'd love for as many guys to be involved in that as possible. I'll be putting it out on the WhatsApp group where the venue will be this week. Uh, so just kind of keep your eyes open for that. But thank you so much for being here with us this week. Uh, hope you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday.